there was a pastor in a rural community, a rural church made up of, uh, the congregation was made up of mostly uh, farmers, and of course the farmers' wives. And uh, the pastor went out to this uh, one farmer's house. Uh, he hadn't been to church in, in quite some time, so he goes out there to talk to the farmer, and he, he's visiting with the farmer, and, and uh, they're talking to one another, and finally the farmer says, uh, well, uh, pastor, I'm sorry I hadn't been to church in a while, but you see I've been out here on the farm farming uh, raising my crops and raising my livestock trying to make a living for my family and it's taking me seven days a week to do that and I just wanted you to know that tell you that I'm sorry that I haven't been to church and the pastor wanted to tell the old farmer that uh, that he needed to trust in God and have faith in God and and to demonstrate that and and he didn't know exactly how to say it so where the farmer would, would understand so so he just asked him a series of questions. He said, well, let me ask you this. If God gave you 20 hogs, what would you do with them? The farmer said, oh, man, if God gave me 20 hogs, I'd, I'd keep 10 and I'd give 10 to the church for the work of the Lord. And so the pastor says, well, what would you do if God gave you 10 hogs? What would you do with them? Oh, I would just be so thankful. I'd, I tell you what I'd do, I'd keep five of those hogs and I'd, I'd give the other five to the church for the work of the Lord. And pastor nodded and he asked him a final question. He said, well, what would you do if God gave you two hogs? Well, the farmer had a real serious look on his face, almost a sad look, and he looked at the pastor and he said, Pastor, you know that's not fair. You know I only have two hogs. So I ask you this morning, what is the Christian life based on? What is the Christian life based on? Is it based on faith or is it based on works? One commentary that I read said it this way, many of Christendom's prominent theologians have focused their attention on faith to the essential exclusion of any concern for works. The unnecessary and unscriptural separation of faith and works has kept reappearing like a, like a defective gene year after year and decade after decade and century after century in the ongoing life of the church. Well, how do we reconcile this statement to the teachings of Paul that we find in the book of Romans when he talks about the righteousness of God and he asks the question or he gives us the doctrine of justification by faith. How do we reconcile these two viewpoints? If you would, open your Bibles with me to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. As many of you know, James is, of course, the half-brother of Jesus Christ. And so not only has he claimed Jesus as Lord and Savior, he's also the half-brother of Jesus. He got to spend all that time with our Lord. And in the book of James, this letter, he has turned his focus to faith's expression through works of righteousness. And in James chapter 2, we're going to look at the passage of verses 14 through 26. What use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can this faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed, and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe, and they shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? 
For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. What is the Christian life based on? Is it faith or is it works? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, as we come together in your house, it certainly is a privilege and an honor this time that we have together. Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom and discernment to understand what the Christian life is truly based on, whether it be works or whether it be faith. Lord, give us that understanding so that we might do all the things that you asked us to do, so that we might learn from your word and march on as Christian soldiers according to your glory and according to the riches that you have given us and that you have for us. Be with us this time with the empowerment of your spirit upon this place. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now there are three parts to this passage that will help us answer that question. Is it faith or is it works? And it's broken up into three. The first one being verse 14, which is the inquiry or the question. Verses 15 and 17 is the illustration or the story. And verses 18 through 26 is the indoctrination or the instruction or the theology. So let's pick up in verse 14 with the inquiry or the question. What use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith but he has no works, can that faith save him? You see, James is asking the same question that I asked. What is the Christian life based on? The only difference is he asks it much better than I do. But it's still the same question. In verses 15 through 17, we have the illustration or the story that helps us understand what it is we're trying to think about and discern. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, of what use is that? Even so, faith if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. If someone came and knocked at your door and said, and you opened the door and that person said, please, I'm famished, I haven't eaten in such a long time. Would you please provide me with food? Of what use would it be for you to drop on your knees and pray to God, oh God, please help this person. Please provide the food necessary for this one at the door and then send them on their way. Of what value would that be? Should we not invite that person in and set them down at our table, open the refrigerator and provide their needs? Is that not of more value, of more use to that individual? You see, James is asking the same question. The, person's, the, the comment there is go in peace and be warmed and be filled. Of what value is that? That person's needs were not met by someone who could have met those needs. And then we have the indoctrination that we see in verses 18 through 26, and we'll take these verse by verse. We'll begin at 18. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. You show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. James has issued a challenge here. How can we prove our faith without our works? If we have no works to substantiate our faith, how can we go to someone and say, I have this faith? with no evidence of it. There's a story of a, a tightrope walker who was at Niagara Falls and he was walking across Niagara Falls on the tightrope. Uh, tight and he was doing all those tricks that they do, you know, where they hold the bar and they have the umbrella and they have the bicycle. He's doing all these things to the amazement of the crowd. And finally he worked his way back to where the crowd is and he says, how many of you think that I can get on this tightrope and walk across it with a wheelbarrow? Well, everybody raised their hands and said, I believe that. Everyone was in agreement. You can do that. And he said, well, how many of you think I can take this wheelbarrow, put a person in it, and walk across this tightrope and make it safely to the other side? They were all in agreement. Yes, we believe you can do that. He said, which one of you will step forward to get into the wheelbarrow? There were no takers. You see, they said they believed, but did they truly? If they had to believe him, they would have stepped forward and got into the wheelbarrow. Their actions did not represent what they said was their belief. They said they believed he could, but in fact, they could not. They did not believe that. The challenge is, how can we prove our faith without our works? Verse 19, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe 
and shudder. There's a, an interesting word here I want us to look at. It's the word believe, translated faith to a certain degree. Look at this. You believe that God is one. You do well. The, the demons also believe. You see, if you believe and reconcile that as salvation, then where can we put the demons at? Because they also believe in God. They know he exists. Notice that the word believe, there's more required than believing. Again, the demons believe. And what happened to the demons? They shuddered. Why did they shudder? You see, they had the knowledge, but their actions did not match their knowledge. It was not carried out by actions, by works. Verse 20. But are you willing to, to uh, recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? I ask you a question. You're sitting on your couch, or in my case, that easy chair that I'm so fond of. If you doubt that, that's my wife. I kick her out when I get home get on my chair if you're sitting in your chair or your couch and someone rushes over and knocks on your door and says your your child is in the pool across the street drowning will you not react immediately and go across the street to save your child from drowning why because you believe it to be so now if you thought that person was uh, tricking you or playing a game with you or you did not believe that person you would sit right back down on your couch or in your easy chair would you not you see, your faith, your belief would require that you act upon that knowledge of your child drowning. Let's go to verses 21 and 22. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. Abraham had faith in God. How do we know that? Because he carried it out. He was willing to lay up his own son Isaac upon that altar because God told him to. He demonstrated his faith through his actions. When Paul says that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, he is referring to the Mosaic law. You see, the people at that time that he would be referring to were legalistic. In other words, they would try to carry out the letter of the law as best they could without the inner parts being involved. In other words, with no faith, with no love in them. And so when Paul talks about this, he's talking about the Mosaic law. He is not referring to the works that James is speaking of. Keeping the Mosaic law did not require faith. It only required obedience because having true faith, initiates actions in us it initiates it propels us to action to works that's what true faith does verse 23 and the scripture was fulfilled which says and abraham believed god and it was reckoned to him as righteousness and he was called the friend of god you see abraham by carrying out his faith into action he was called a friend of god i want to ask you a question if you were to stand in the presence of God right now and he looked at your life based on your works, based on your actions, would he call you a friend? Would he call me a friend? Look at your life. What works do we have to offer that would demonstrate our faith and our belief in him? You see, we need to have a passion for our faith. Instead of praying, if I should die before I wake, we should pray, Lord, wake me up before I die that I might serve you and glorify your name in all that I do. Verse 24. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now this verse 24 is in response to the original question we saw in verse 14. That is, is the Christian life based on works or is it based on faith? And the reply here is that unproductive faith cannot save because it is not genuine faith. Faith and works are like a two-coupon ticket to heaven. You cannot go to heaven with one or the other. They have to be together. It's a two-coupon ticket to heaven. They must be accompanied by each other. What I'd like for you to do is keep your finger on it, James, here, because we're going to go back to it, but I want you to do this for me. Flip over to uh, Luke, Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. 
I want to share something with you. The other day, I was visiting with a friend of mine. His name is Ira Brown, and he's hiding right now. <laughs> uh, I told him I was going to do this. It just struck me that when we had that conversation, it just hit me that I was working on a message that dealt with this. And I'll tell you why. I asked Ira the other day, I said, let me share with you the message of my, or the title of my message. It is this, Faith or Works. What is the Christian life based on? And I'll have to admit before you and before him that I had an ulterior motive. I wanted to see if it would elicit a response from him or whether he would just go about his business and do whatever. I wanted to see if that title would elicit something out of him. And so I went my way, he went his way. About five or ten months later, he came up to me and he, he looked at me and he said, what was the title of that message again? Have you ever been at some point in your life where you knew you had someone? You piqued their interest and you knew that, that they were there listening to you. And he asked me, what was the title of the message? And I repeated it. Faith or works, what is the Christian life based on? Now, you have to understand this. As a preacher, we want to just run straight forward. Now, if it had been me on the reverse, and I would have said, oh, no, that's no good. Or, or ask whatever question came to my mind. That's just our nature most of us. But now, my great friend Ira, he's in the counseling program, so he tends to be a lot more tactful than I am. And so he asked this question. What about the thief on the cross next to Jesus? And I thought, wow, that's a great question. That's a great question. What about that? Because that will answer our question. Many people look at the thief, and he's up there with Jesus on the cross. How did he have works? And yet, we know the result of that. So as we are turned to Luke chapter 23, I want us to pick up in verse 38. Now there was also an inscription above him, this is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who were hanged there was, uh, was hurling abuses at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuked him and said, do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Was it faith or works? What did the man say? Did he believe in Jesus Christ? He had to because he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He acknowledged Jesus Christ as the son of God. He believed in Jesus. He acknowledged that. He did have faith. He believed in Jesus. Did he have works? He absolutely did. Why? He confessed it with his mouth. Right there in front of the multitude. He confessed Jesus as the Son of God. He did have works. Look at it this way. What if he was on the cross? And he believed it in his heart, but he made no expression of that. Of what value would it have been? Is that not what James is talking in this, in this passage that we've been reading? Of what value is your faith if it's not carried out in works? And yet the thief on the cross confessed him as Lord and Savior. He did have works. You can turn back over to James. A Christian man worked each day by transporting tourists across the lake. You know, this morning the message... Uh, was what is the mission of the church and the answer to that was to seek and to save that which is lost that is we are to be witnessing to one another and so when I read this illustration I thought man this is wonderful this guy's doing a wonderful thing and so what he does his job is to take tourists across this lake and what he did was he put on one oar he put faith and on the other oar he put works and the people would pile in his boat, and he would begin rowing them across the lake. And he got in the middle of this lake, and he would stop, and he would begin rowing with just the faith. What happened? He went in circles. He went nowhere. He went in circles. Then he stopped. And he began rowing with the other oar that said works. And what did he do? He went in circles. He went nowhere. And then, as he would begin to row both of them again, he would be moving forward. And by this time, the bewildered passengers were waiting for an explanation. And this afforded him a wonderful opportunity to give them the truth concerning discipleship and the Christian life. He always concluded this by saying, You see, neither faith nor works can stand alone. 
They are twins, and they cannot be separated. They cannot be. Verse 25, And in the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? As I looked at this verse, and I compared it to verse uh, 21 that talked about Abraham, it just, I just felt so blessed. Because in verse 21, it talks about Abraham being justified by works. And verse 25 says Rahab was justified by works. And what it meant to me was that God loves us so much that he does not look at our life as we would look at people and say, that's a good person and that's a bad person. Abraham would be what we would call a good person. And yet he was saved because he believed in God. And we look at Rahab, and as being a harlot, we would look at her and say, oh, what a wicked person. And yet she was justified by her works. She too was saved by God. It gives me encouragement that despite the lives that we come across, despite our own lives, how despicable they might have been before, we can be made clean and whole and righteous unto God because of Jesus Christ. And I just found that to be a very beautiful point that's in this passage. Verse 26, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Is the Christian life based on, on, on faith or is it based on works? I submit to you this evening that it's based on both faith and works, faith and works. We see in, in, in verses 21 and 24 and 25, we see justification by works. You know, Paul talked about justification by faith. Well, how do we weigh that against justification by works? How, how can we marry the two together? Do they mean different things? No. If you consider their viewpoint, Paul was evangelistic. He evangelized. That is, he presented the gospel in order to save the souls of people. And so his perspective was, believe unto Jesus Christ so that you might receive eternal life. James is a pastor. He's coming at it from a pastoral viewpoint. This letter is to Christians, and he was a pastor. His take on it was justification by works. If you have true faith in you, it will be evident in your works. It's a two-sided coin. Billy Graham had this to say about faith and works and the relationship to each other. There really is no conflict between faith and works. In the Christian life, they go together like inhaling and exhaling. Faith is taking the gospel in. Works is ex exhaling the gospel out. Actually, what James is saying is you can't have one without the other. The book of James balances off this matter of faith and works and reminds us that the Christian must have both. Now, it is true that we are not saved by works, and we're not. But James reminds us that reminds us also that we are not saved if good works do not follow. Some people argue this point so vehemently that it almost becomes like the old argument of which comes first, the chicken or the egg. You see, the word believe comes from two words, the words be and the word live. You see, faith helps us to be spiritually. But after we receive life, it must find expression in Christian works and in Christian deeds to show that there is no conflict in the scriptures between the, poo, be, between the two. Paul, the advocate of faith, speaks of being rich in works. On the other hand, James, the exponent of works, says, be rich in faith. Why be content with either when God has provided for and says that we must have both? Faith and works are partners. They're not rivals. They are complementary, not contradictory. They are two dimensions of God's great gift of salvation. They are inseparably linked together. Faith does not exist apart from works, and works cannot exist apart from faith. One without the other is a road leading to nowhere. Has your life demonstrated your faith? Do you really have the faith? Do you really believe? If so, works will be evident in your life. God's word here in James tells us that we cannot have one without the other. Let's say this. Let's say you were coming up here. This is a trial. This is a courtroom. And you had to come up here and sit on the witness stand. 
with a jury of your peers present. And here's the question. Are you a Christian or are you not? And the only evidence that we have to either support or deny that claim is your works. And you're sitting in the witness chair. Would you be found guilty or would you be found not guilty? Faith and works go together. Paul Harvey rightly said, if you don't live it, you don't believe it. The true faith of a Christian will make its presence known by the expression, by the acts and by works. Would you stand for me with me with prayer, please? God, I pray to you this evening. Lord, would you please break us and humble us before you? Lord, I pray that as we seek you, as we search you, Lord, give us the passion and the desire and the true faith to serve you, to make it evident in our lives and to those around us. How will the world know about you if we don't tell them and if we don't express it? Lord, give us the desire and the hunger and the zeal that you have and that the apostles had and those great Christian men that we read about. Lord, help us be like them, that everything we do would bring, would bring glory and honor unto you. Help us to be faithful all the day long so that at your feet we could leave our works and give it to you knowing that you are the originator of it it was because of your love in jesus christ in us that we did all that we did each of us having our own talents and our own gifts may they be used for your glory and for your honor lord i pray this evening if there's one here that has never claimed you as lord and savior in the true sense lord in the true sense may they step forward at the invitation and today they would be saved. Today they would accept you as their king. And Lord, I pray if, if there are any other decisions that need to be made this evening, Lord, please let them be made so that we as a church can pray for them, encourage them, and lift them up. And I just pray that if anyone needs to come to the altar, they will do so. Lord, let your people be willing to make the, de the decisions that we need to make. May your spirit be present in us to give us the fortitude, the strength, and the courage to make those decisions. Lord, we lay at your feet with the words, I love you, knowing that you loved us first. Thank you for all things. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.